So let's continue talking about beta now. Beta is a measure of systematic or market risk. So a firm will have its beta and different divisions and projects within a firm will have their own beta depending on their risk level. Very simplistically put, the beta of the market is equal to 1. So uh, a given stock that moves up and down with the market will also have a beta of 1 if a stock is more risky than the market so let's as we discussed before if the market is going up by 2% the firm goes up by 4% or the stock goes up by 4% if the market is down by 2% and the stock comes down by uh, twice that then we say in this case the beta is equal to 2 We'll talk about beta and its interpretation in a lot more detail when we do portfolio management. A firm's beta is used to estimate its required return on equity. So this is uh, another critical concept that we've already discussed. And essentially what we are saying here is that we can use CAPM. So the required return on a given stock is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. So the risk-free rate for a given economy is given. The market risk premium is the expected return of the market minus the risk-free rate. So that is also given for a, uh, for a particular economy. So the only variable that is uh, stock-specific is the beta. So according to the CAPM model, if we have the beta of a stock, which represents the riskiness, we can then find the required rate of return. Higher the beta in a given economy, higher the required rate of return. So this concept is easily applied not just to firms, but it can also be applied to a project or a division within a firm. So that's what is stated here. So likewise, a project's beta is used to adjust for differences between a specific project's risk and the average risk of, firms or of a firm's project. So the point here being that if a given project within a company has higher risk, then we adjust the beta and come up with a higher required return for that particular project. Now, very again, keeping it rather simple, you can think of beta, that beta depends very simplistically on two things. One, it depends on the nature of the business. So some businesses inherently will be more volatile and more risky, and they will have a higher beta. Some businesses might be very stable, and they will have a... Uh, low beta. So this you can think of as a operational contribution. Then the second thing that beta depends on is leverage. So higher the leverage, higher the risk and hence higher the beta. Now what we are going to see on the next slide is how we can how we can figure out the a project beta or a divisional beta. The method that is used is called the pure play method and let's see how this goes to understand this is, uh, better let's just look at it in the context of uh, a large company called Enro which is a conglomerate so it has many different businesses uh, under its fold and let's say that Enro is a public company so it has a publicly traded stock but Enro has a food division and for, for various reasons, the senior management at Enro wants to figure out the, the beta for the food division. And if you recall, to figure out the beta of the food division, we said that it would depend on two things. It would depend on the type of business. So this would be based on the operational risk. And second would be, it would depend on leverage, which means how much uh, or financial leverage, how much debt has this firm taken on. We are also given that for this food division, the debt to equity ratio is 0 0.7 and the tax rate is 40%. So the, 
so this is data given for the food division now with the pure play method given this scenario the first thing that we do is identify a comparable publicly traded company so let's say that we find this company called Ness which is publicly traded and this is purely a food company so this is very comparable uh, so this is comparable with the food division of Enro so simplistically again the nature of the business is the same so from a operational riskiness perspective these two entities are the same but with Ness we determine that the debt to equity ratio is relatively low so let's say that the debt to equity ratio here is 0 0.5 so that's the debt to equity ratio and let's say that the tax rate for Ness so here the tax rate is equal to 35 percent for this company now let's determine so what what we need to do here is uh, so step one was identifying the comparable which we did now step two is determine the asset beta for this comparable company asset beta means uh, what would be the beta of Ness if there was no uh, debt so for that we need to actually also know since beta is a since Ness is a publicly traded company it will have a beta so let's say that the beta of Ness is equal to 1.5 in step 2 we are calculating the asset beta of Ness that is going to be equal to uh, the equity beta of Ness which is 1.5 into 1 over 1 plus 1 minus the tax rate which this is the tax rate for Ness which is 35 percent so 1 minus 35 percent is 0 0.65 multiplied by the debt equity ratio of Ness which is 0 0.5 so let's do this calculation very quickly so when we do the calculations we figure out that the asset beta of Ness is 1.13 so as we would expect the asset beta for Ness is lower than the equity beta because we are saying that for this company in this business if there were no leverage then the beta is lower and since our food division of Enro is in exactly the same business as Ness the asset beta for Enro's food division would also be equal to 1.3 so in the last step we are in the last step we are taking the asset beta of Enro which is 1.13 this is actually the asset beta of Ness which is the same as the asset beta of the food division and saying 1.13 and then we are saying what would be the equity beta which means we are leveraging this up based on the debt equity ratio of the of Enro's food division so this would be 1.3 into 1 plus and then the tax rate 1 minus the tax rate remember the tax rate for this entity is 60 is 40 percent so 1 minus 40 percent is 0 0.6 times the debt equity here which is 0 0.7 so this is equal to 1.60 and this should not surprise us a first of all this is greater than the equity beta which is obvious and this is also greater than the equity beta of Ness which also makes sense because the debt or the leverage uh, financial leverage of Enro's food division 0.7 is more than the leverage that we took here for Ness which was only 0 0.5 so this might seem a little complicated but it's not and there are several questions in the curriculum uh, which you should practice once you do so then you are in good shape okay another important concept is that of country risk so using CAPM in developing, uh, in developing countries for estimating cost of equity is problematic 
because beta does not capture country risk. So very simplistically, you can look at this from the perspective of an American investor who wants to invest in Pakistan. So clearly, for him, there is some risk investing here. And the way he would factor in the risk would be to use this country risk premium in his CAPM model. So if he were to invest in a Pakistani company, for him the required rate uh, of return would be equal to the risk-free rate plus beta into the expected return on market minus risk-free rate plus something called the country risk premium. We don't need to get into much detail here. This is treated, uh, you know, dealt with in level 2 and level 3. So I think from your perspective, as long as you understand that there is this country risk premium that increases the required rate of return on a stock in the in an emerging market or a developing country that's mostly good enough in case the examiner wants to really drill you on this which again is unlikely but just in case you need to know what uh, how we derive this country risk premium clearly the more risky a country the higher this country risk premium and hence the higher the required rate of return and they are actual in different textbooks give different formulas for CRP and even within the CFA curriculum at different places there is a different uh, formula for CRP but at this stage the curriculum says the following so it says that the country risk premium is equal to the sovereign yield spread so we'll call this the sovereign yield spread uh, multiplied by the annualized standard deviation of the equity index of the developing country so in Pakistan so for an American investing in Pakistan this this term is the annualized standard deviation of the equity uh, index so this would be the standard deviation of the KSC 100 so if the KSC 100 index is very volatile this would be a high number divided by the annualized standard deviation of the sovereign bond market in terms of the developed market currency so then we this is divided by the uh, sigma b so you can think of this as the bonds that pakistani government has issued either in euro or in dollars and we look at the deviation or the standard deviation of um, of of those bonds the sovereign yield spread is equal to the developing countries government bonds de denoted in the developed market currency so this is say again Pakistani bonds uh, let's say Pakistani issued uh, uh, the bonds issued by the government of Pakistan which are denominated in dollars minus US Treasury bonds of the same maturity so if, if the world perceives Pakistani bonds as being very risky, then the sovereign yield spread would be high. You will understand this a little better when we do fixed income securities, but uh, at this stage, hopefully you have a general idea and um, really unlikely that you are tested on this. But if you just know these basic points for now, you are in good shape. The core point is that the riskier a given country, the higher the CRP. Now let's talk about the concept of marginal cost of capital and the marginal cost of capital schedule. So marginal cost of capital is the cost of the last new dollar of capital a firm raises. As a firm raises more and more capital, the cost of different sources of finances will increase. The marginal cost of capital shows the whack for successively greater amounts of new capital investment for a period. Earlier we saw this line, we saw this as a upward, uh, a nice simple uh, line sloping upwards. But now we are going to show you that this is a slightly more complicated. So the way you can think of this is as follows. Here is one possible, normally this would be some sort of a step function. So we might say that between 0 and 10 million rupees for a given company, the weighted average cost of capital is 14 percent and then from say 10 to 15 million the cost of capital is 
16 percent and then from 15 to 20 million the cost of capital is say 18 percent and so on so this is a possible uh, marginal cost of capital schedule where we are saying that as we try to keep raising more and more capital what is happening to VAC so as before there is an upward trend but here we are being slightly more realistic and showing that this is most likely some sort of a step function now all these points over here where there is a change in the cost of capital these points are referred to as break points and just memorize this definition now and we'll use it on the next slide so a break point is equal to the amount of capital at which the component cost of capital changes divided by the weight of the component in the capital structure so the different components typically being debt and equity so on the next slide i'll show you how we how we use this okay so let's do so through an example so so let's say you get the following information about the cost and availability of raising various amounts of new debt and equity for a company now this is rather simple but for the company you are evaluating if the amount of new debt raised is less than 40 million then the cost of debt is 14 percent if you are raising if the company is raising more than 40 then the cost of debt is 16 percent so as you might expect if the company is trying to raise more money it is paying a higher rate for new equity if equity issued is less than 50 million then the cost of equity is 20 percent greater than 50 then the cost of equity is 22 percent now we are also given the target capital structure which is 60 percent equity and 40 percent debt so based on the formula we saw on the earlier slide let's first come up with our break points so we said that the break point is equal to the amount at which a cost of a component changes so let's look at debt first so the break point for debt is uh, 40 million divided by the the percentage of debt in the capital structure which is 40 percent so divided by 0 0.4 so 40 over 0 0.4 will give us 100 million so this this is one break point then the next break point so in this case if we had uh, other values of debt at which the cost of debt changes we'd have additional break points but we just have one for simplicity what about the break point for equity this is going to be 50 which is the amount of equity at which the cost of equity changes divided by the percentage of equity in our capital structure which is 0 0.6 so the break point for equity is 83.3 and here again in this simplistic example we just have a uh, one break point for equity it uh, in more complex scenarios we can have multiple break points but to illustrate uh, this uh, the the usage of break points this is good enough so essentially then what we are saying is the first break po break point is at uh, 83.3 and then we have a break point at 100 so we only have two break points which means that from 0 to 83.3 we have one VAC and then from 83 to 83.3 to 100 we have another VAC and then above 100 there is a third VAC so in this scenario we just have three weighted average cost of capitals so we have done the break points now let's calculate the VACs at these three levels so at this level we have a cost of debt of 14 percent and weightage of debt of um, of 40 percent so 0.4 and the weightage of and the cost of equity is 20 percent times a weightage of 0 0.6 so if we do 14 into 0.4 plus 20 into 0.6 we will get 17.6 
at 83.3 equity becomes more expensive because remember this was a break point for equity so then equity becomes uh, expensive so equity becomes 22 percent so to calculate this point we have uh, 14 into 0.4 plus 22 into 0.6 which should give us 18.8 and then after 100 we have both equity which is expensive and debt is expensive so to calculate this VAC we do 16 percent into 0.4 plus 22% into 0.6 which should give us 19.6 so that gives us our uh, schedule we now know that depending on how much money we want to raise uh, given the capital structure that will define how much of the money will be equity and how much will be debt and then given the rates we can figure out the overall cost of capital Flotation costs. So flotation costs are the fees charged by investment bankers when a company raises external equity capital and even when we raise debt capital there are uh, flotation fees. So money charged by investment bankers to publicize and so on. Many financial textbooks incorporate flotation costs directly into the cost of capital by increasing the cost of in external equity. According to the CFA Institute, that is not the correct treatment. So what is the correct treatment? That's given here. The correct method to account for the flotation cost of raising new equity capital is to increase a project's initial cash outflow by the flotation cost attributable to the project when calculating the project's NPV. So the point here being very straightforward, which is saying that let's say that your gross proceeds when you issue new equity are on a per share basis let's say equal 50. So this is how much money you raise and to keep this simple let's say that this is a, a preferred share and you are going to pay a dividend of uh, four dollars. So your dividend is equal to be going to be four dollars per year. Now to come up with the cost of equity what we need to do is we need to consider what the flotation costs are. Let's say that it was a very expensive flotation and initially you incurred ten dollars per share had to go to the uh, had to go to the investment banker. So in your initial cash inflow you just say that you got 40. So on 40 inflow if you are paying four dollar dividend every year then the cost of preferred shares would be 4 over 40 which is equal to 10 percent. Bottom line being any cost incurred simply reduces the amount of money that you raise up front and then after that you can figure out whatever the return is. So that's flotation costs. And this brings us to the end of the reading. As always please practice as hard as possible. In the curriculum there are several good uh, examples so make sure you go through them they are for a change pretty short except for perhaps example 13 the rest are short and easy uh, I'd appreciate if you share your comments on YouTube right underneath this video if you have any that way I can make improvements later and if you like this video please click on the like button that's it for now I will see you later if you found this clip interesting and informative, please visit my website www.rfirfanullah.com. Here you will find a tremendous amount of useful material. Right here in the 2011 CFA video lecture series, you will find the entire level 1 curriculum for free. And most of the material here is still relevant. So this is worth looking at. The 2012 video lecture series covers both level 1 and level 2. These lectures are available for a fee. And uh, finally down here, uh, financial management at IBA. Here you will find my lectures at IBA uh, for a course on financial management. Plus you'll find lots of useful spreadsheets that can help you with financial modeling. So again, please visit www.rfirfanullah.com. Thank you.